was scared, you know, that if I don't do anything this guy tells me, that I'm gonna end up getting killed. He was really close to our family. I was 14. I was 15. I was 11. I never really gotten any attention from boys. I always thought that I could totally handle myself with the best of them. I was a perfect target. He made me touch him in an inappropriate way. I started pulling my pants off. And I was like a baby, a little chicken. He started unbuttoning my shorts and put his hand on my pants. No. Stop, stop, stop. It was like something went off in him and then he would freak out. I'm gonna kill you. And he had complete control. He just ended up raping me. He told me not to tell anyone. That's not a bad boyfriend, that's, you know, that's, that's rape. Now I know that it can really, really happen to anyone. My name is Bernadette Ignachuk and I was born in Brooklyn, New York. My mother was an alcoholic and a drug addict. I don't know my father. I was taken away from my mom when I was six years old because my mom buried me with a cigarette. And um, I went to Little Flower Residential Treatment Center um, right after my 11th birthday. One of the staff members took me in my room and closed the blinds and like locked the door and molested me. I did not say anything right away about what happened, but um, I ended up running away. And from there, I ended up going into the convent. And I really liked it there, but um, my grandma, she didn't like the fact that I was leaving her alone and that I would never come back. I just finally um, left on my own. Three months after I turned 17, um, I was raped by a taxi driver. I scratched his face and then I ended up running away from the car. About a week later, this priest comes to my house. And then when he started asking me questions about it, he started pointing and he started touching me in the places where the taxi driver hurt me. I was not part of reality. I was having flashbacks, I was in the mind of a 10 year old. I was in Little Flower. <clears throat> in, um, in my room and being molested by a staff member. Then the priest was saying, asking me about how uh, my relationships with guys. And I said that I'm scared of guys. And then he started saying that he wants to show me how I don't have to be afraid of guys anymore. And he said that he's going to show me how sex could be good. So then the priest ended up raping me. When the priest um, said before he left that he asked me if he can come again um, when my grandma's not home, I didn't say anything. And then he left because he said he had to go to, he had to confess people, crying sitting in the dark and just crying and just just crying because I felt so guilty because that was a priest and how could I let that actually happen, you know. I was very upset and I, I couldn't concentrate in school and and I was kind of freaking out and my teachers were asking asking me about what's, what's the matter and they brought my school social worker. And after I said what happened, the cops came. 
They brought me to the emergency room to do a rape kit. And they found forensic evidence that made him guilty. When he got arrested, he was interrogated by Polish detectives. They asked him why did he do this. And he said, because I wanted to show her how sex could be good. And, and he tried to deny it later. He tried to deny that A, I didn't understand what they were talking about. And I say, you don't understand your own language? They were talking in Polish. And plus they have everything on video. So they have the whole interrogating process on video. So he couldn't really, that was the proof right there too. And when this whole incident happened, people who already knew who it was because I was living with my grandmother and they knew me and they knew my grandmother. So they were harassing me, whispering behind my back, calling me names and everything. And even the pastor of the church, of, the, of Sacred Heart Church, he even said in church, he even called me a tramp and said that I tried to do this for money. And he, the pastor, and some other people bailed him out. He pled guilty to what happened. But people say that he's still innocent and that he was coached to say that he was guilty. But because he pled guilty, he got nine months of jail time and will be deported back to Poland. It didn't make me feel good, but it made me feel like I could actually start healing now. The supporters of the SNAP group have been supporting me and I feel good that, that someone actually supports me and know what I've been through and that kind of helps me with my healing process too. And now after the whole case, I have enlisted into the army to be a military police officer. It was something when I was a little girl that I've wanted to always do. And I believe that the military could help me a lot. I would say to girls or anybody who have been abused by anybody, sexually or physically, that not to keep it in, not to hold their feelings in, not to, not to, you gotta open up to somebody. You can't just hold it in because it would just eat you up. It would eat you alive. And if you keep all the anger bottled up inside, it would just make you such a crazy person. I still consider myself a religious person, um, even though this this thing happened with the priest. I still, in the beginning, it was tough for me, but I still have my faith, and that's something as a Polish person and as a Catholic that has helped me a lot. You have to be strong and try to move on. When I was a freshman in high school, no one, no boy had ever told me that I was attractive before. And I met this boy, and he played football. It was all very exciting, but then it started to move very quickly, very, like, in a very short period of time. It was very um, frightening. And he started trying to have sex with me, and I was 14, and I, I was so young, and I had never been in that situation before. I had known this guy for three weeks, two weeks. 
it, it was like this recurring pattern of him taking me somewhere, whether it was a classroom that no one was in, like a student lounge where no one was around, it was, whether it was outside, and he was very aggressive. It was like he had something to prove. Everyone in the school, it seemed, knew that we were doing this. My, my teacher started to notice, because we had class together, they would notice how extremely uncomfortable I'd get. So he'd want to sit next to me and he'd start touching me, like putting me in the middle of class. Like we were in the middle of a discussion and he'd like have his hands all over me. I used to get bruises on my back from him like squeezing me. And he would, he would always try to take it to another level, like whether he was putting his hands like down my pants or whether it was him trying to rip my clothes off. It was like something went off in him and then he would freak out. And he'd get all super aggressive again, which isn't what sex or losing a virginity or making love is about. I mean, the only time that I'd ever come close to having sex was when he forced me to do it. The last time I tried to break up with him, he put his fist through the glass window and there's blood everywhere. He created this whole idea in his head that we were in love, that I was the only one for him. He didn't, as far as I know, even to this day, that he still doesn't think he did anything wrong. Like. I don't think he has the capacity to look back and say, hmm, maybe she didn't want to suck my dick. Like, maybe I shouldn't have yelled at her after that. I just needed to really uh, separate myself from him. And, and I, could, I stopped talking in my classes, and I, I, couldn't, I couldn't, like, voice my opinion. I didn't even try in those classes. I just, like, failed. I just did really badly. I became really depressed and I got all worried and then school ended and uh, I started to cut myself. I started, I have like scars and you can't really see them anymore but they're like on my wrist. I thought about killing myself all the time. I just hated myself. I couldn't believe that someone as outspoken as I am will let that happen. Like I couldn't believe it. I was just disgusted by myself. I thought I was so dumb. I had to go get tested for learning disabilities and because I had done so poorly in my math class. And for some reason I told this lady who was testing me. She was like, yeah, well, that's not, that's not a bad boyfriend, that's, you know, that's, that's rape. And so she asked permission to tell my mom, and she did. And then I started going to therapy. I pretty much think that it's good for all teenagers to have an adult to talk to that aren't their parents or teacher, because, um, and I've always thought this, because Kids, they need an alternate perspective that's not going to get them in trouble. They need someone to go to to, um, to talk just because chances are they've been there or they've seen it. If they're a good therapist, they're not going to call up your parents and and say, well, your daughter told me this in, in this, our session today. And to have that is something that I, I think that all kids, especially girls, should have. It's taken a long time, taken a long time. It's taken a lot of mistakes, a lot of therapy, but not only like therapy going to a therapist, but a lot of like reflection. Um, I mean, um, writing in a journal was really, really helpful because I could write anything that I wanted and I could say anything that I wanted. I could draw whatever I wanted. It didn't matter. It's been hard for me to paint things that represent who I am. I know, like, out of my close friends, at least five people that have been in my similar situation and felt that they were, if they said anything to the school, then their parents would get angry at them for putting themselves in the position of whatever, in a compromising situation or whatever, the school would punish them. I think all schools should have, um, have a center for kids to go to just where they can express themselves more than just a psychologist or a mandatory class because kids need a safe haven. I was with my girlfriends. The boys came, as they often do when you're 15, <laughs> and um, they brought with them some, you know, some beers and a bottle. And you know, Mark 
we didn't go to high school with him. He was older than us. I think that I was a perfect target. I was a fresh face. We had never met. I was overweight, not confident. I think that he knew what he was doing the second he walked into the, the party. He offered to go and get something to eat and, you know, come with me for the ride. So I went with him for the ride and pulled down into a back abandoned parking lot. At that point, he got physical. Uh, he grabbed my arm and said, no, no, we, you know, you're, you're going to do this. And I said, no, I don't want to do this. He grabbed the back of my neck and pushed me down and made me perform on him that I did not want to do at all. Very scared and not knowing if I should just get out of the car and go or how am I going to get home, you know, what, do I, what am I going to call my mom at two in the morning. I can't even explain how I felt. There's no words to describe how you feel after that happens. Didn't say anything to anybody, didn't do anything about it. I, I just couldn't hold it in. I had to talk to somebody and, and I told my mom. And mom, of course, her reaction immediately was, we have to tell your father and we have to go to the police. And I said, I don't want to tell dad. <laughs> I don't want dad to know. I made her tell him on the phone. And he got on, the, and then she gave the phone to me after she told the story. Of, and uh, it was the second time in my life that I ever heard my father cry. And it was really hard to hear my dad cry. <laughs> Waking up and going to school every day was very difficult. Uh, I got a lot of, a lot of teasing and a lot of name calling more so from girls, actually. The boys would just sort of give me a dirty look when I walked by. The girls were ruthless. And um, another week passed of my parents just being so supportive and, you know, but they very much wanted me to go to the police with it, and I very much did not want to go to the police. And after a week, they convinced me to go, and they arrested him. Uh, we went to court. The judge said, we put you on probation for doing this to two other girls. You turn around, you do it again. We offered a plea bargain of eight years, six before probation. He didn't take it, didn't take it, didn't take it. The day that I was set to testify, they took it. They put him away. Um, they apologized to me in front of the court for not putting him away the first time. Um, four other girls approached me in school and say, thanked me for doing what I was doing because he had done it to them and they didn't do anything. They never told anyone. They, they just couldn't. They wouldn't. I don't know. I think he's literally incapable of having remorse. I think that he is a very sick person and I think that he needs a lot of help through counseling and coming forth to the police and writing and letting those negative emotions out in positive creativity, I've gotten through it. It took me six years to get here, and every day I'm still working to be better. When I came to college, like, I'm not a big drinker, and my friends were drinking a little bit. This guy had become a decent friend of mine, and so we ended up, we sat around, and he would come in and sit with us every once in a while. So I was sitting there, and pretty much, like, 30 seconds after they left and had gone out the door, and I could hear them going down the stairs, 
um, the guy walked right back in and came in and got right on top of me. Um, and, I, and I remember I said, like, uh, what's up? What, what are you doing? And he put, he took my hands and put them above my head and sort of shifted my whole body up. So my hands got stuck under the couch and I kept saying stop. And I always thought that I could totally handle myself with the best of them. And this guy was not bigger than me in any way. Like he was about maybe an inch taller than me, didn't look very muscular and he had complete control. And that was, I just remember this feeling of like just fear and horror just going through my whole body being like, oh my God. And just pulling down my my uh, zipper and stuff. And he said, come on, baby, let me just put it in. Let me put it in. And I kept saying, no, stop, stop, stop. And I'm like squirming as much as I possibly can at this point. And it's weird because I totally had the impulse to kick him in the balls. That's, And then there's that little thing inside your head which was going, no, he's my friend. <laughs> and it's like, it's the stupidest thing to possibly think. But it really sad, and you're like, well, maybe, maybe he's not doing what I think. No, he is doing it. And then the door opened, and as soon as the door opened, he jumped up right off me, and I pulled my shirt down and zipped up, and they clearly had an idea exactly what was going on. So I went the next day to the dean, um, had a meeting with him, told him everything that had happened. Um, so we had the trial, which was three weeks later, but he was basically like expelled. And now he's gone all next semester, and I was really, really busy, and just didn't deal with it. Just put everything in the back, like, moving on with my life, moving on with my life. And I started getting flashbacks and anxiety attacks, and totally reliving what had happened to me. And I could never be alone. I, it, was, it was the most dreadful, horrible time. I, I went to the counseling center at school because I didn't know who to go to, and they sent me up with Dr. Pearson. And I've had a therapist before, and it was horrible, and I hated her, and I dreaded going every single day. And Dr. Pearson helped me so much. Like, she's one of the most amazing women I've ever met. And, um, and I don't have flashbacks, but, but I'm more sensitive towards violence towards women. You can either make yourself be a victim or not. I think victim is such a negative word. It's, it's like, you're never going to be a change because this thing happened to you. And it's, it's part of, it becomes part of who you are, you know? You're never going to be able, you can't try to hide it. You can't try to bury it. I mean, I tried doing that and that doesn't work. Um, but it makes you stronger. So many people don't come forward and I just, I, I know how hard it is. And the whole process sucks. It sucks so bad. And there's nothing that's easy or light or anything about it. But it's better to try to do something about it than just let things go through the cracks. And I guess my advice for women is be firm. Like, if you don't want something, don't be afraid and don't be ashamed or, or care about, like, how people are going to think about you for, for saying no or for, you know, standing your ground. Just... That's what gets us in the problem. We don't stand our ground. Some kids have and some kids don't. And some of us are wondering why. And mama watch the news at night. There's too much stuff that's making her cry. We need some help. We need some help. The first time I remember Wayne showing like really weird behavior was when me and Wayne were sitting in the pool and he grabbed my hand and he made me touch him in an inappropriate way. And this was when I was around six years old. And at the time I didn't really know it was wrong. I didn't know what was going on. And I knew, well, I mean, I knew there was something weird about it, but I didn't think it was wrong. I didn't tell my parents about it. The second time he sexually abused me was when I was nine. And it started out as we, me, his grandson, and him were playing hide and go seek. So me and Wayne went off to hide, and he asked me if I wanted to hide in the bathroom. And I didn't, 
yeah, I just said, okay. And so I went in there, and and I remember him, when we got in, he locked the door. And I knew, I didn't, I asked him why he did that, and he said, so he won't be able to come in if he finds us. He asked me if I wanted to sit on his lap. And I said, okay, and so I sat on his lap. And then after a little, like a minute or so, that's when he started unbuttoning my shorts and put his hand on my pants. And I, I kind of just sat there and I was kind of like frozen. I didn't really know what to do. And I told him that I didn't think he should be doing that because I thought I knew it was wrong. And so he let me get up and he said, he told me not to tell anyone. I went over to hide somewhere else and his grandson found me and I decided to tell Tristan what happened and he told me that I should I should tell my parents and he also said that if I didn't it'd probably keep happening. And so I told my dad and my mom and I was kind of scared to tell him. I was really nervous and I had no idea how he would react and I was really confused on what was going on and what they would say. I was crying and he started crying too. We got a lawyer and we tried to put him in jail. And uh, in Mexico, they don't really enforce their laws that much. And so Wayne paid off the judge and he didn't have to go to jail or anything. I didn't really have many friends and at school, it was really hard for me sometimes because a lot of kids made fun of me because I was adopted. My therapist would tell me that it was my fault that they said those things about me. And I kept telling my parents that she was making me feel really bad, but they didn't really believe me until one day they decided to sit in and they realized that she wasn't really helping. We moved to the United States and the therapist I'm seeing now, we ju mostly just talk about what's going on in my life and she's helped me figure out some stuff. For one, it wasn't my fault that all of that happened, which is something really important that I learned. I've learned that, you know, uh, that, you know, you can't really trust everyone. At this point, um, whenever I think about Wayne, which really isn't as often as I used to, um, I don't really get angry or sad or I just think that, you know, he needs help. I'm 14 years old now and the error, like from that experience, it's, well at the beginning I was really kind of afraid of men. I was even afraid of, of my own dad and I was afraid of, you know, for some time I wouldn't let him touch me or even hug me. And I, w I didn't like to sit on his lap or anything. And now, you know, that, you know, now it's the time when, you know, you have all your boyfriends and stuff. Um, I, it's, I've learned how to say no. Right now, I think boys in general are pretty much just pigs, <laughs> honestly. I mean, not all, but a lot of them, that's all they ever think about is sex, 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 sex. It's, that's just everything. And I just think it's really disgusting. I mean, they think girls are just things that they can use. I mean, we're not. You know, you need to be really careful about who you're trusting and also it right now you know you're kind of figuring out who your true friends are you need to be really careful with the people that you hang out with especially guys that you hang out with and if there's anything weird about them you should just you know be aware of what's going on and you need to keep your eyes open and also to, you know, like kids who know like if they know about their friends being abused or even brothers or sisters you know, you have to tell someone. Even if that person tells you and they say, don't tell anyone, you have to promise me you won't tell anyone. You need to tell like a, the school counselor or someone. Sometimes I just wanted to die. And so I'd cut my wrist when my parents weren't home. It feels good, like at the beginning. Um, that's the scar that I have from when I cut my wrist. I didn't have to get stitches from it, but it was pretty bad. And they said that if I cut a little deeper, I would have hit a vein. That would have been really bad. And um, I, when I did it, I wasn't really doing it to kill myself. I was just really upset, and that was just the only way I could.
because like it really expressed how angry and upset I was and like the reason I think why it feels so good is because you feel like like you know sometimes the like if you open it up you know it's like the pain pours out it's really not that cool I mean it's not cool at all Mostly why I stopped is because I saw how much it hurt my friends and my parents. You know, you need to find other ways of expressing your anger or depression and besides like hurting yourself. And, you know, because it's not good for you, it just makes it worse. Maybe if you're like me, like I don't really like talking about it that much. I'm, I, I'd like to, I would like to write it down a lot. Also drawing helps or you know if you like to express your anger by screaming and yelling you could like take karate classes or something or sing i love to sing and that singing always makes me feel better it's like Please raise your voice some help down here on earth a thousand prayers a million words but one voice was heard <laughs> I feel really good now <laughs>